Welcome back, or for the first time, to the Irish Myths YouTube channel. My name is IE Neverday, and this is part three, the third, and at least for the immediate future, final installment of my What is a Banshee series. If you haven't watched parts one and two of my Banshee series, which are respectively the definition and etymology of Banshee, that's part one, and the physical and sonic characteristics of the Banshee, that's part two, I absolutely encourage you to hit pause right now and go back and watch those first. I'll link to them in the description description below. Or you can just keep chugging along with me in this video right here in which we'll be exploring who banshees visit. Whom banshees visit? Because it turns out banshees don't haunt households willy-nilly. They don't prey on any old people approaching their expiration dates, but instead focus their efforts on frightening the descendants of specific families. More on that later. But first, have you watched those other two videos yet and liked and subscribed? No big deal if not, because to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to do a quick Banshee recap. Use the time codes below to jump ahead if you'd like. So, the Banshee. Is she a demon? A spirit? A fairy? Actually, she's pretty much all of those things combined. A Banshee is a supernatural being from Gaelic, aka Goidelic, Celtic folklore who warns of the impending death of someone in a household. In some accounts, she is a hideous, howling hag hovering at the window, while other descriptions paint her as a youthful beauty, sometimes the ghost of a family member, a child whose cherubic chant welcomes chieftains to the churchyard. The Banshee's name is derived from the Irish Banshee, which translates literally to Woman of the Hills. However, it's important to note that a she is not just any old hill. When the gods of Irish mythology, the Tua de Danann, were driven underground, each came to occupy a she. The gods grew smaller and smaller in popular imaginations, literally and figuratively, until they became the A-She, the people of the hills, otherwise known as fairies. Given this divine connection and the Banshee's infamous vocalizations, it's possible that the Banshee's origin lies with the Irish goddess Bridget. A goddess of fertility, hearth fires, and poetry, amongst other things, Bridget's cult was significant and she was believed to visit the hearths of her worshippers, leaving footprints in the ash. Irish mythology tells us that when Bridget's son died in battle, the goddess invented a name high-pitched singing style known as keening, which features eerie moments of silence as well as outbursts of weeping. This mourning practice, which persisted into early modern Ireland, may help explain how a goddess associated with life could be reimagined as a harbinger of death. A spirit demon fairy with a penchant for performing for those about to perish. Whom do banshees visit? If learning about the haunting habits of banshees has gotten your spine tingling and your knees knocking, good news. Statistically, you're probably immune. Or rather, if such a being as a banshee truly exists, it's unlikely she'll ever pay you and yours a visit. Unless, of course, you're Irish. But not just Irish, and I promise I'm using the word just in the gentlest of ways there. Irish folklore dictates that banshees will only attach themselves to members and or descendants of Ireland's old families, as D.R. McNally Jr. calls them, or families of the pure Milesian stock and never ascribed to any descendant of the proudest Norman or boldest Saxon, to quote Scottish poet and novelist Sir Walter Scott. So yeah, there's this whole blood purity and ancestry component to Banshee lore too, and as Sir Walter Scott alluded, that lore is rooted in Irish mythology. The Milesians were the last race of invaders to settle in Ireland, conquering the Tua de Danann and sending them underground. Yes, you heard that right. The Milesians, the forerunners to Ireland's modern human population, were responsible for literally and figuratively burying the goddess Brigid and her divine kin. I mean, if I were Brigid, I'd hold a grudge. And folklore tells us that banshees are the ultimate grudge holders. To quote D.R. McNally Jr., the banshee attends only the old families, and though their descendants through misfortune may be brought down from high estate to the ranks of peasant tenants, she never leaves nor forgets them till the last member has been gathered to his fathers in the churchyard. The McCarthys, McGraths, O'Neills, O'Reillys, O'Sullivans, O'Riordans, O'Flaherty's, and almost all of the other old families of Ireland have banshees, though many representatives of these names are in abject poverty. Yikes. 
uh, banshees don't mess around. Now, according to Elliot O'Donnell, the whole banshees only haunt pure-blooded Irish people interpretation is overkill. Or, as she puts it, I do not believe that the banshee would be deterred from haunting a family of historical fame and Milesian descent, such as the O'Neills or O'Donnells, simply because in that family was an occasional strain of Saxon or Norman blood. However, she concedes that there needs to be at least some, quote, Celtic Irish, unquote, origin for the family. And I quote, On the other hand, I do not think the Banshee would ever haunt a family that was not originally at least Celtic Irish, such, for instance, as the Fitzwilliams or Fitzwarrens, although in that family there might happen to be periodic infusions of Milesian blood. Lady Wilde gives the most leeway when theorizing who was eligible for a visit from the Banshee. In her estimation, one need not be Irish. A gifted musician or poet could also qualify. O'Donnell, for her part, scoffs at this idea. And I quote, To be haunted by the Banshee, one must belong to an Irish family that is at least a thousand years old. Were it not so, we should assuredly find the Banshee haunting certain of the musical and poetical geniuses of every race all over the world, which is certainly not the case. A parting gift. So, how are we feeling? Are you relieved that a Banshee visitation is statistically unlikely? Or are you bummed that you'll probably never get to see or hear a Banshee yourself? Well, I've got some good news if you fall into the latter camp. Banshees sometimes travel abroad. According to O'Donnell, Banshees that have attached themselves to, and I quote, the most ancient of Irish families will travel when, and I quote, and only when they accompany those families abroad. Still, if some of those old families move to the States or to Australia or to the UK and so on, welp, there you go. Thanks to the Irish diaspora, diaspora, which one do you guys say? Diasp diaspora? Thanks to the Irish diaspora, there could be banshees all over the world. So regardless of where you live and roam, the next time you're lying in bed and hear the clatter of an errant shudder followed by a faint, sorrowful cry, don't be too quick to blame the wind. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment and basically just tap all of the shiny buttons and by the end of it, make sure you are subscribed to the Irish Myths channel. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn more about the Banshee as well as other monsters from Irish mythology, check out my book, Irish Monsters in Your Pocket, a tiny little book about Irish dragons, werewolves, vampires, banshees, headless horsemen, and other beastly beings. Irish Monsters in Your Pocket is the third book in my Celtic Pocket Guides series and you can find links to it in the other two books in the series, Samhain in Your Pocket and Irish Myths in Your Pocket, in the description below. My name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of irishmyths.com. Thanks for coming out.